Nano Hub U online instruction. Hey everyone, welcome to lecture four or five. In the first four lectures, we talked about lasers, and now we're changing gears to talk about the beam propagation method. And then this will lead us into some other multi-physics applications. So let's begin. So basically, uh, we're starting with the Helmholtz equation. So this is very similar to the uh, photonic crystal master equation that we had earlier, except that now we're assuming that epsilon inverse is basically a constant, okay? So then we actually get to take that epsilon inverse that was originally in our master operator, curl of epsilon inverse, curl of H, and then move it to the other side so it looks like a just an epsilon. And so then we have uh, epsilon can be written if it's real as just n squared. And so then we have curl of curl of H is equal to uh, n omega over C squared times H. And of course, curl of curl can also be represented as a minus the Laplacian. And so then that gives us the Helmholtz equation, which is here. And then H could either be, or sorry, psi could either be an H field, like HZ, or it could be an EZ. And so we're just writing it very generically at this point. And you can always assume a solution uh, for this kind of system that has a certain form if you have like a fiber type structure like we talked about in the last lecture that has uh, basically this value phi and we can assume phi is the quote unquote slowly varying envelope times some sort of uh, uh, exponential in the z direction which depends on the effective wave vector along z which is usually called beta and so uh, those two terms can be uh, basically factored out. You can substitute this into the Helmholtz equation, do the math, and I'll leave that as an exercise to you. And then you can actually prove that you get minus Laplacian of phi, and then you get a term associated with the beta that looks like 2j beta z hat dotted into uh, the gradient of phi is equal to k perpendicular squared times psi, right? And so k perpendicular squared psi is closely related to n omega over c squared minus the beta squared, of course. And so to simplify the problem even further, we could actually drop, in some cases, the second derivative in z, since we kind of assumed that uh, we're slowly varying along z. And so then that allows us to simply write this as kind of a first order equation along z. As So basically, the rate of change of the envelope phi as you propagate in Z would be equal to J over two beta times this uh, transverse Laplacian of phi, and then plus uh, J times uh, K perpendicular squared over two beta times phi itself. And so then you can actually uh, try to write it a little more simply by essentially defining this part here as U, and then this part here is W, so the definitions are here. And then that gives us something that's very simple, d phi dz equals u plus w times phi. So it just looks like a first order differential equation, which is fairly simple looking. So uh, no, this is, doesn't mean that it's not interesting or powerful though, because not only could you use this to describe uh, something as simple as uh, propagating down uh, ordinary fiber, but you could also use it to understand current nonlinearities. So you could actually substitute uh, for this transverse mode, uh, a second derivative in time. And so then that would capture dispersion. And then you can also substitute uh, basically a phi square term, which represents the intensity. And so this would be like a current nonlinearity going back to the previous unit. Um, and so then of course the functional form is exactly the same as we have earlier. So even though it looks like very simple, you can add a lot of interesting physics and describe it using this approach. So of course the challenge is the following. We don't actually know the value of W as it's uh, propagated up front, right? So all we can do basically is evaluate W, whatever that W is, whether it's like this equation here or if it's like this W here, we can only evaluate it at our current position. But then we can use that to uh, kind of get an inference for what W of Z plus H after it's propagated would be. And then we can actually work backwards to refine our 
a subsequent envelope function at the new position uh, phi of z plus h. Okay, so if you kind of work forward and backwards multiple times and iterate it, then you can create at least a self-consistent solution. Of course, we still have the the caveat that we're uh, making certain simplifying assumptions to uh, particularly drop the second derivative in z. So although this will be faster, uh, it could suffer in accuracy if we have certain kinds of structures or very, very strong nonlinearities and so on. So you have to be a little cautious about applying it. But uh, you can see that basically if we know that the step size is small enough and it's a first order derivative function, then we can actually write a formal solution pretty much immediately. And you can check that this is always going to be correct, that uh, phi of z plus h would be e to the h times u plus w times this phi of z. So you can kind of see that it's acting basically to uh, uh, basically provide this extra uh, set of operators. You can actually expand it as 1 plus h times u plus w. And you can actually go back to the difference equation and show that that's actually a very good approximation uh, when uh, delta z, which is now h, is very small. And also, uh, going back to this exponential term here, which is more general, then if the u and w operators commute, then we can actually rewrite uh, the the sum in the exponent as a product of exponents. So basically we write it as e to the h u times e to the h w. And then we can actually re restructure it. So we apply half of this before e to the h w and then half of it afterwards. So that creates a more symmetric form. In the next lecture, we'll talk about what are the implications of this beam propagation method uh, for solving real problems.